Okay. Uh, now, can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes, can do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Excellent. Uh, so I think we should start. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Libra uh, webinar organized by the British Blockchain Association. My name is Nasim Nakwi. I'm the president of the BBA and editor in chief of the journal, and I'm also your host for this webinar. Um, just a few announcements to make before I introduce you to our uh, guests and start the session. First of all, uh, the aims and objectives of, of, of this webinar is to have a, uh, a high quality educational discussion uh, around Libra and the current landscape of cryptos in the context of global economy and also the road ahead. So this is uh, uh, going to be a, a neutral educational debate, uh, not saying uh, what is, uh, right and what's wrong and, and it's to have a, a constructive uh, educational uh, critical appraisal if you like of uh, what is Libra. So we will get some live questions uh, from the participants. We have received some already and please feel free to uh, write your questions in the chat box and we'll try our best to accommodate as many as we can. Uh, for the CPD certificates please email our admin team with your name uh, and they will be sent out to you afterwards. So this webinar is recorded and we will upload the recording on uh, our YouTube channel <coughs> under Creative Commons. So that point they will be accessible by general public. So um, let's begin and let's enlighten ourselves and learn more directly from experts. I'm really pleased to have uh, a very nice mix of specialism today. Uh, we have a, a cybersecurity specialist, a lawyer, a, a crypto uh, a researcher. Anish is in, in India. He's trying his best to attend. I think he's looking for some decent internet connection. Uh, he's, he's traveling. So <clears throat> let me introduce you uh, to our uh, panelists. Uh, we have with us uh, Cal Evans who is on the advisory board of uh, the BBA, and he was also an advisor uh, to Libra. Uh, we also have with us Professor Kevin Curran, who is uh, the associate editor-in-chief of our journal, and he is a professor of cybersecurity at Ulster University in Northern Ireland. And we have with us Demelza Hayes, uh, who is uh, also one of the editors of our journal, and the author of crypto research report and i believe she's uh, currently pursuing her phd um, uh, in in this area so <clears throat> let's get started um kevin uh, if if it's okay I'll, I'll probably want to start with you um that's okay we um how do you see the, 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 the cybersecurity aspects of, of something like Libra for consumers and end and users, which is initially kind of a consortium based permissioned uh, cryptocurrency model? And how do you see the, the Libra blockchain itself in terms of um, uh, cybersecurity and, and security for the end users and, and consumers? Yeah, they have. In the papers that they've released, they've released an overall white paper, they've released a paper on the reserve aspect, they've released a paper on the blockchain as well. And they, call, they do play and place an emphasis on security because obviously they know that any blockchain really rests on the foundation of security. And a lot of the security of the Libra blockchain rests on the correct implementation of validators really, and the move programs and the move virtual machine. Again, so, the, you know, the, say that they're already working on this in the Libra core and it's a working process, but they have to isolate parts of the code which contribute to a validator signing a block of transactions again. So again, that's one of the important things as well. But they also have to take into account with Libra that they have to be able to 
cap the amount of resources like CPU, memory, storage, again, that are allocated to other nodes. Again, so this prevents against denial of service attacks as well. And also, again, what they have is, you know, they, they have a lot of state, as, to be honest, the foundation of the security rests in their state machine replication protocol. Again, it's called the SMO protocol. Mm. This is meant to protect against any denial of service attacks again and make sure that all the honest nodes observe the same sequence of commits again. So this is very important, of course, that we don't have the double spend. And again, that new commits are produced as long as valid commands are submitted again. So there's a number of aspects as well, dealing from the, the virtual machine, the actual language that they use as well is very important. The Rust, again, which focuses on enabling safe coding practices, but of course the validators as well. So they have thought about as much as you could expect them to think about at this stage. Yeah. Yeah. And the... The, the the big debate is 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 all about kind of self sovereign identity and a global identity is not conferred upon you by the state and we if we do eventually become global citizen then people are saying that clearly something like Libra and your e wallet which is both your identity and your money and the currency so do you think it would become more important than your national passport even at at some point in future. It's possible. I I wouldn't have necessarily thought that Libra would become that that uh, you know that actual identity. But again, that people will watch to see this Libra work. Um, but in some ways, for a national identity, yes, I, I do think a blockchain will play a part in that. I mean, it it just makes sense. But the thing about Libra is, and the fact that it has the backing of Facebook and all these consortiums and the way it's designed, it actually is quite pragmatic. It actually makes a global cryptocurrency possible because of the way that it stops the speculators as well. So I can see why Facebook and others are involved and why they've set this up the way it is. And it really is well thought out. I know people will be jumping up and down because Facebook's involved, but to be honest, I don't have too much of a problem with it. I think it's a very clever idea, the whole thing. But for national identity, you do not need the setup that they have here. The reason you need the setup that Libra has, the complicated setup, the, the real world and the crypto and the blockchain and everything else is because of the speculation, because of trying to peg the currency. Yeah. Well, national ID, all you need is a secure blockchain and you don't need to have something which is able to scale as well for transactions really because we're not talking about processing um, something on the scale of Visa or PayPal or whatever else. So mm. I think this would be using a sledgehammer to, you know, to, 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 to break a nut. I think this is too heavy for any... It's, 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 it's not, you can have a slimmer version of a blockchain for a national identity. Yeah. Uh, Demelza, you, uh, you wrote a research report on crypto assets. Um, how do you see this, uh, this new development? I mean, Kevin mentioned about Libra pegged to a dollar and some other liquid assets and, and currencies. So you wonder if the real application of Libra then as a, as a digital currency is more for kind of a, a payment processor to, to streamline this process more, more than anything else? Well, I mean, I think there's something to, I think there's a difference um, between pegging the value of the purchasing power and backing the value of the purchasing power. So for example, um, the US dollar, its purchasing power is not pegged necessarily to the reserves that are held by um the government by the central bank and mm -hmm. by the treasury so actually i think it's not going to exactly be pegged to the reserves but it's going to be backed by the reserves in the sense that if something happens to the value there will be reserves um held by the association that can be used to to buy units or sell units um on the open market so that the price is so that the purchasing power is stabilized over time um, so I think that it's, it's not actually going to be pegged uh, to the dollar. It's going to be backed by their reserves. And I think that's why this is such an important, um, you know, kind of uh, move in the whole entire space because we've only seen so far um, competitors that are basically pegging their value to the dollar. And I think that now it's not going to actually be pegged to the dollar's value. It could actually be um, stable 
to to a reserve basket of assets. Um, and I think that that is definitely representing a a real competitor uh, to the dollar. Yeah, interesting point. Um, Carl, you are a lawyer. You have also been a strategic advisor to Libra. And we have seen U.S. Congress now asking Facebook to halt the project and they want more info. They want to examine things further. And people are also saying that in the white paper, it says that Libra is, is, will be backed by, by securities, liquid assets and currencies. So something backed by security will become a security itself. So where are we heading? Is this the start of the, the war between crypto versus Federal Reserve? And how do you see things developing from here? Yeah, um, I think the the distinction needs to be made here that um, Facebook has, has made it clear that there's there's no intention of any kind of war um, because uh, Congress has made a, a formal letter um, to Facebook itself actually formalizes the process, um, which means that when um, Maxine Walters, the, the <coughs> chairwoman of the uh, House Financial Services Committee, um, began speaking about this, um, she tends to have a little bit of a very bullish approach if you look at the way that she speaks about anything. Uh, when we look at the student loan issue that was taken a number of months ago and now looking at Facebook. So this step by them was was really kind of expected. And Facebook's response has been uh, very much what everybody in, in turn expected. And that was, you know, look, we're looking forward to, to working with lawmakers um, and pushing the process forward. And I think when we speak about it in the context of um, decentralized versus centralized, um, I, I believe that um, this is a step closer towards centralization because the, the, the first issue that has occurred is that the government has stepped up and said, look, um, this could be or, or is intended to be, um, as, as, as the uh, people on this, in, on this conversation, this, this debate have spoken about, a competitor to the US dollar. And um, realistically, if we look at it in a purely legal sense, the, the US dollar is one of the few things that's very rarely spoken about in the US constitution, but it is understood through legislation that the only body that is able to create any kind of financial instrument within the United States is the United States government and that legally in a in a legal sense uh, the only um, federal um, the only financial instrument that can be used within the United States is the US dollar um, FX markets taken aside of that in so much as the dollar isn't actually excuse me any other currencies aren't actually used within the United States and so there becomes this real underlying constitutional issue. Um, but ultimately, Congress doesn't really know what to do about it because Facebook has, has, has quite clearly stated in things such as the white paper and, uh, and the other documents that they've produced that um, it, it is going to be a medium of exchange. Uh, they, they kind of fall short of screaming that it is going to be a full currency. And so there kind of has, we've entered if we were in a gray zone before as to what cryptocurrencies really were, um, in entering this new kind of issue of we're producing a currency, it's also going to be marginally centralized and it's also going to be backed by other things. We're now entering a completely new gray zone. So it'd be very, very interesting to see what the formal approach is, <clears throat> excuse me, that Congress takes with this. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Uh, Anish, can you hear us? I know you said you have a bit unstable connection. Hello? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Anish, yeah, hello, welcome. Uh, oh, thank you. Thanks for joining. Uh, Anish, um, you, are, you are a researcher, you are a teacher, you teach on cryptos, blockchain. What are your initial thoughts? I mean, when you heard about this, uh, the Libra being launched and um, are, are, we, are we ready for mass crypto adoption? I mean, Bitcoin has been around for 10 years. Uh, do do people understand money better now? All of a sudden, people are talking about, um, you know, the the currency money not issued by a government but by a, a federation. What are your thoughts on this? So uh, I'm probably going to put my hand up and say uh, everybody has been expecting Facebook to have a so-called crypto initiative. They bought uh, one particular startup out of London. 
So they wrote a paper, SOK, on consensus. So they reviewed the consensus mechanisms and they proposed some new ones. And uh, they were bought out by uh, Facebook. So that implied they were going to do something. The question was just like, what is it that Facebook was about to do? So the answer to that question was, okay, we are going to do something in the middle. Mm. It is not going to be a truly decentralized, but it's going to be something that's federated. It's not going to be a real blockchain. It will be a kind of a database with a timestamping mechanism to run some sort of consensus. Yeah. That's, that, that were my thoughts. And there are some improvements that being brought along, but definitely it's actually showing, A, uh, Facebook has the interest to get not only the social transaction graph, but the financial transaction graph too. So that would effectively give them a lot more leverage. The way I think about Facebook is like their optimization function or that their objective is just to, you know, return more money to their shareholders. So right now they have been optimizing ad delivery and what they now have is a financial data. So in theory, if you were an insurance company who was providing insurance for mortgage default, given uh, in a particular instance, if you have two parties who are sharing that mortgage, because Facebook has insights to the behavior of both of them, they will have better ability to predict. So literally the future could be a very much a lemon market. So there is that possible, uh, you know, worst case scenario at one end, and the other end is the possibility that you have the ability to transfer value, I, I won't call it money, value within this bounds of the ecosystem. And if you were to look carefully, I, I've spoken to at least two parties who have signed up to this Libra consortium so far. They, they've given a lot of flexibility about their, you know, how, how you integrate with them, what data you need to expose. Mm -hmm. But they are all also concerned about this capture. What I mean by capture is like if you join the Libra consortium and if you expose all your cons consumers to Facebook, who knows tomorrow if they're going to produce a service that will, you know, undercut them. Mm. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And you asked me about, uh, you know, crypto mass adoption. I don't think, I wouldn't call this crypto. I mean, for me, I, I'm a more a purist in that sense. It's like I, I, I've worked with different protocols, but I'll still say, you know, to be called a crypto in that sense, you need to have a decentralized mechanism. This definitely is nowhere near a decentralized mechanism. As far yeah. as I can see from all that's published, uh, mm -hmm. maybe it might be changing and evolving over time. And about mm -hmm. your question about people understanding money, I think we are far away from understanding crypto economics. <laughs> Right, and uh, we are far away from understanding uh, the money from a crypto perspective. Mm. Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean it's an interesting point. Uh, when you read these comments and and opinions from some supporters of Libra, they say, "Well, it, you have a token which is based on a cryptography and intended to be used as currency to buy goods and services. So, by definition, it becomes cryptocurrency." But then. Uh, the 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 other Bitcoin maximalists they talk about open borderless permissionless and, and no, the, the, they, the, they, the question about business, so it, it is not a cryptocurrency in that sense true sense yeah I mean I did, just to add one small thing apologies for interrupt so all I'm saying is your credit card actually has cryptography okay your debit card has cryptography right whenever you interact with your no. bank you use cryptography would you translate that into to, tokens or crypto in that sense nobody mm. does right so yeah. it's pretty much this construct this is why i used the term crypto economics right it's defined as like the science or whatever that is that actually studies in the supply and demand of digital goods in a decentralized yeah. economy right that's when this you know sense tokens really come into being otherwise token means nothing right yes. if you have a pki a public key infrastructure and you mm. have a trust structure that's actually hierarchical then it's pretty easy. That's what's happening in a bank. So it doesn't require any heavy lifting. Uh, people have been doing this for a very long time. There's no innovation in that sense. But putting a language on top uh, is no big deal. Mm. In, yeah, that, that's the way I think about it. But then I'm a skeptic. Yeah. Um, Kevin, uh, Anish talked about uh, the, uh, in terms of inclusion and uh, uh, global adoption. Now, Libra protocol, now it says that um, does not link accounts to a real world identity and user is free to create multiple accounts 
by generating multiple key pairs. And the accounts controlled by the same user have no inherent link to each other. And this is, I'm quoting Libra paper and says, however, Calibra <laughs> wallet requires that all users will be verified via a government issued identity. So uh, in terms of uh, uh, getting into and using Libra, uh, you can have as many accounts as you like, but to have the Calibra wallet, you need KYC. I mean, how do you see this? Yeah, <clears throat> you know, in some ways, that, in fact, the identity part will be the biggest um, stumbling block that Facebook will, will meet with regards to regulators because we know what cryptocurrency can be used for. <clears throat> and in an ideal world, we would see something that would be able to track people. But of course, you can't get anything off the ground unless you have something which claims to be semi-anonymous. And I have no doubt that you can create as many, um, and, you know, kind of, uh, tokens as you want and have them semi-anonymous as well and of course we got we, we can't forget there'll always be mixtures available so even if it was some way pegged in such a way that people did not want to be tracked in their in their usage you know you could use mixtures to be able to get that out anyone who's semi-tech savvy and of course we know that things always get easier so even the public will be able to do that within a few years but Again, the, the majority of people don't care, really. We, we all know we're being tracked by our credit cards and everything else. The, the majority of us just want some kind of um, <clears throat> easy payment system which allows you to conduct transactions online without giving such a way, you know, a large percentage like we do to PayPal at the moment again. So I don't think that will be a mass issue among users as well. It's only really people in the cryptocurrency or the security community, really, a lot of the time. But because... You know, at the end of the day, it's Facebook, and we give away so much of our privacy to them there. So, uh, again, but I, I think that, I, I think that will be the biggest stumbling block, really. That governments know what, what the dangers of having a cryptocurrency already. Again, and we can't stop it. No one can shut the door. It's here forever. Cryptocurrencies work. It's a true cryptocurrency. That is, it's, it's really what we need for the internet, for the for the shop of the world, really, for the, you know, the, the finance center of the modern world, really, and. Again, I think that they will allow those multiple entities as well. But again, like I said, because of mixtures and everything else, it doesn't matter what what to pick it down to. You can always remain anonymous with a cryptocurrency if you truly take precautions. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Demelza, there is a, there's another debate about uh, the fiat fiat's going to eventually going to zero because they, they don't maintain their their, their, their value over a period of time, even the, even the most stable currencies. So anything backed by fiat uh, will also lose value in terms of uh, uh, where fiat is going. So people are saying that should, should Libra have not been backed by, by Bitcoin or, or gold or something like that? Well, I mean, they, they, they mention in one of the white papers, I think it's the main one for Libra, they say, you know, unlike, you know, we're not going to basically, unlike gold, we're, we're just going to store, um, you know, government debt and, and, and uh, liquid um, assets. But I mean, it, technically, they, I think it wouldn't be very difficult for them in a second step or third step to integrate other assets like Bitcoin or gold. Um, and I think that, I mean, if you, if you look at the model of how the association itself is going to make money, um, I think that this could eventually be a very large fund of assets and they could, the, the investors in the Libra investment token could, could profit from, from managing the reserve assets. Um, yeah. I mean, that they have, they have their own incentives for keeping the value of the reserve assets up. Um, and I think that, over time, if if the fiat currencies that they hold and the and the low interest uh, yielding bonds that they hold are not, you know, uh, supporting the net asset value of the reserve fund, then I think over time they could they could adapt this. But I think in the first step, they need to get the governments on board. And so I think what this can do is it can renew um, demand for government bonds that right now um are losing demand um over time so mm -hmm. i think that you know one thing that's even though there's a lot of pushback from from regulators in the us i think that 
if the reserve fund is going to buy a lot of government debt, I think this would be would be a, a incentive for the government to support this as, as a new um, demand for, for their own debt. And I think, you know, basically Facebook and the Libra, I mean, it could, you know, it, it, since it's going to be international, it could tap into the savings of households around the world. Mm. And I think right now, institutional investors are, you know, becoming, you know, increasingly concerned about holding on to government debt and now this asset could basically fuel demand for government debt from retail households who that don't quite fully understand the risks that they're investing in because government debt is considered risk-free debt in every single textbook. So I think you know retail people could could actually fuel the future demand for government bonds um, uh, as as uh, institutions uh, taper their their investments in, in government bonds. So I think that I think that. This is actually probably, um, in a lot of ways, I think this is going to support um, governments. And I think in the first step, they, they need to show that this is not, you know, they need to come out and say, this is not a competitor. We're only helping the unbanked get banked. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the second step, they could turn this into a huge fund and hold on to actually assets that, that have uh, capital gain potential and even uh, yield, um, you know, higher than inflation. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good point. Um, we got very similar was something along those lines. This question from one of our members. Uh, maybe Carl, probably the best person to 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 answer this. But I'll um, open this to, to all of you. Uh, the question is about censorship censorship resistance and this operating consortium. Obviously, is, they they can block certain transactions. Um, what if you do not have a uh, an, an ID? What if you are a refugee, you are living in Iran, or you are a poor farmer, it doesn't have no identity, nothing. So in terms of this banking, the notion of banking the unbanked and global inclusion in the economy, um, something like Libra or Federated Blockchain Consortium Crypto, is it possible to, to, to achieve that with the with the with the censorship resistance thing that is attached to this uh, Libra model, uh, Cal, do you want to take this question? Yeah, I mean, I think the there's a, that's a great question, by the way, and I think the the short answer for that has got to be no. Um, there's there's the kind of common misconception, especially from projects that I've seen, that um, in developing countries uh, there's there's a lack of access to things such as the internet and so therefore cryptocurrencies won't work or perhaps they're they're not actually a suitable um alternative but there's there's a whole kind of primary and secondary use in these situations and some we already have in the marketplace projects that have done incredibly well that are already providing these cost-effective solutions providing banking facilities to individuals in countries that don't otherwise have access to them and then additionally to that um, there are the cross-border transactions and the cross-border transaction piece is arguably the biggest element here um, and the reason that a lot of people choose to use cryptocurrencies for cross-border transactions ignoring the speed in which it's done is actually the anonymity that comes from it the great level of anonymity means that cross-border transactions enables people that are not necessarily looking to break the law but protect themselves um, there are a number of government regulations in various different places that stop people from simply providing for their families um, and sending money across borders. And I think that um, the minute that Facebook uh, placed and announced and, and made the strategic decision to conduct KYC, um, they've, they really have removed the decentralized element from, from what a true cryptocurrency is. And that's why I think this is, um, and I'll be in the interest of full disclosure, I think this is an absolute mutant of something that's being created. Um, and, and I know that it was being spoken about a moment ago about being backed by bonds and things of that nature. If we really peel away this onion, and I, and I appreciate I'm segueing into something else here, if we peel away this onion, the, the minute an organization has the power to purchase a huge number, a huge amount of government debt, uh, they de facto become a third party 
quasi government organization and we saw this with organizations like Fannie, uh, Fannie Mae, Fannie Mac that, that, that are not strictly government organizations but yet hold a, a premise of government power and when Congress is looking at questioning Facebook's motives here as to the currency they're also undoubtedly going to be looking at this bond purchase um, and, and this kind of underlying asset class because they are creating a currency which is backed by something which everybody knows in simple economics the us dollar isn't so in theory it could make it stronger than the us dollar but the minute it in and of itself is backed by a commodity that is issued by the us government it becomes tied to that and so if the bond market was to fail yes we know u.s governments uh, u.s governments guarantee the payment and the holding of the finance the bond the underlying bond value itself which is also traded on a secondary market could itself collapse and so we end up in this very bizarre situation where they have to undertake a level of KYC, back it by something that maintains its value because we've seen that currencies that themselves rely on trading volumes inherently just drop and dump all over the place. And so, yes, there's a stability piece there, but does it enable people to have this utopia of access to bank accounts and make easier cross-border transactions? If they're tying it to government-based assets, it absolutely doesn't. And so it, it removes this cleanness that I think they're trying to promote and and creates this kind of issue where really people aren't going to see the benefit of this that i think facebook is attempting to promote mm. and people are also asking that can i trust my data with facebook with all the the recent issues and facebook's being in, in, in the news and uh, data breaches and all those things so facebook is saying that well look we we have got only one like one of one of the hundred votes, uh, or one uh, percent, or, or something like that. So, can can people still trust their 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 data, their identity info, and now also their money currency with the with Facebook consortium or an initiative launched by Facebook? Kevin, any comments? Hello. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> that they, they are a brand and they're they, they're trusted to some degree by people. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, they have a chance, and of course, it's not just Facebook again. It's 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 a story with some of the bigger players in, in in finance, really online and and also just the online world, really. So, really, th there is trust in it because it, honestly, it's just not Facebook again. It's some of the some of the brands that we all deal with on a daily basis as well. You see the governance structure that seems to be in place. They've thought about things, and you know, they have thought about the, they have thought about the complaint or the, the transparency aspect as well. So, you know, we, we trust banks, and the banks in the past have got, have, have gone bust. Um, you know, with governments, and we know governments can be corrupt as well. So you have to put your trust somewhere. But yeah, they do have a, they do have a chance of really gaining the trust of people, but it's only through time again. And, Again, one of the problems again is really the, the wallet aspect again. That I, I, I do just to go back to the point about it becoming um, a way for people in poor countries again, or people deal banked to be able to do business. It's just not ready yet. It's 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 it, it, it's just still that little bit too complicated for people having to put the trust in a wallet. Really, it has to be yeah. simplified in some ways, and that's why the impairs have worked so well because it's really sending money with a text message. And of course, people know the makeup of a bank. They know that you put your money in a bank and you have a a certain amount of them. You have an account number, you maybe have a password as well. People are familiar with that and that's why the password itself is still the gold standard because people are familiar with that rather than more sophisticated biometrics again. So until yes. some wallets and cryptocurrencies and the way we know them become much, much simpler, it'll be a while before people who, especially the people who don't have a high level of education, start to use this as their daily banking system. Yes. And the, 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 all the, the, the payment uh, solutions, Visa and MasterCard are all getting involved in part of the consortium. Um, what's, the, what's the future here for them? Uh, are we going to be using uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain-based um, payment systems and these companies are, will get involved or will we just see uh, two parallel systems while they are still part of consortium but having the just a digital fiat is, uh, instead of the actual Libra crypto. 
Anish? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I, I would actually reflect uh, a similar amount of cynicism that Kevin had. So j j just to add something to this whole uh, conversation that you had, generally speaking, value generally implies trust. The, you know, if you're going to say if in Libra is going to be trusted by everybody, that implies everybody is going to have the trust. And one of the key things I should point out is it's a tragedy of commons in, in a larger sense. I, I think Cal also mentioned about this in a broader sense. So everybody in the ecosystem will all lose if Facebook decides to, you know, do whatever it requires to do, right? So there is a misaligned incentive. And going back to the question you asked, will there be two sets of things existing at the same time in all likelihood? Uh, yes, because uh, right now the rails that's being used mostly is the Visa and MasterCard rails. Uh, they get an amount of money from everybody using it. But if the crypto space is going to have higher levels of efficiency which, and higher levels of throughput, both of which are a challenge. And that's probably why the reason, you know, Libra is not actually a traditional crypto in that sense, by architecture. So it is very possible we might end up actually having uh, two sets of rails. Uh, the way I describe it is like, I consider the traditional crypto more like bazaars, which are open. And uh, what Libra kind of sta stands right now is like a cathedral model where you have walled communities where value can be transferred between them. Mm. And another question people are asking is, 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 is Libra a security? Is that, is that a security, Demelsa? Well, okay. I mean, I'm not exactly a legal expert. I mean, it depends on where you are based, I guess, if you're based in the U.S. or if you're based in... Uh in Europe. Um, I mean, I think you have this, you have the two tokens in this system. You have the one, which is the medium of exchange, which is the Libra. I think that's not a security. And then you have the, the Libra investment token, which is going to provide some type of investment contract for the 28 firms that are currently involved in, in potentially up to 100 firms if Facebook reaches its goal. And I think that that's definitely a security because I mean according to the Howey test but I think that it would be difficult for people to argue that the that the Libra itself is a security. Gal anything to add to this? Yeah I mean again because it's so um, as the Mizela was, was pointing out very very accurately it's it because it's so international um, the jurisdictional agnostic piece in this um, <clears throat> really does um, kind of open it up to interpretation. If, if I look at it from a, a UK lawyer point of view, I would argue that no, it's uh, it's it's not anywhere near any kind of security. Um, but then if I look at it from uh, a US point of view, I would argue there are elements there um, because the controller is doing a certain amount to um, basically shore up the price value um, the, the, in a, the, the purchase of bonds is like Facebook saying, look, we're going to do everything we can to protect the price. The minute, uh, any kind of issuer turns around and says, Hey, we're going to do some things to protect the price. Um, it then instantaneously almost becomes some kind of security. Although I don't genuinely believe within the current framework, there is any kind of mechanism for it. I think Congress's step so far is Congress acknowledging that perhaps there needs to be something towards that. Um, but I know that there are other jurisdictions where it's absolutely considered security um, and other jurisdictions where it's not. I think, um, and, and Kevin and Anish are gonna be able to speak more to this. I, I do believe that in order to fully answer that, you also have to look at the technology side of things. We know there are other companies taking part in this. We know that there are other use cases for it. So um, I don't think there is a really truly clear cut answer to that. Um, and I think that is, could be a whole nother debate in and of itself, but um, it's, it's certainly a very, very interesting point to look at. Kevin, any, anything to add to this? Sorry, you, you cut out me there. The question again, sorry, I, I missed the last minute. So the, the question is, uh, how do different countries see this when if you have to go through the, the, the legal process and jurisdictions, approvals, 
uh, have to comply with the laws of certain countries and frameworks. So how would you see this development in terms of, in the context of global economy and if, if five or six major economies, China, for example, if they restrict it, ban it, oppose it, where do we go from here? Yeah, of course, they can try, but there really is no jurisdiction on the internet. Mm -hmm. well, we all know the rise of VPNs, whatever else. So a country can say what they want, but users who can bypass that in a second. There is no jurisdiction online. Of course, of course, they will face opposition in, in certain places. But of course, you know, consumer demand will. If 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 X percent of the large, you know, traders online like Amazon start to adopt it and eBay and all the other ones, which at the moment use various payment systems, of course, consumers will want that. And no country wants to be left in the in the dark ages as well. So so the the users will will force the government's hand on anything, of course. And, but. Facebook is facing regulation all over, you know, all over the place. And of course, again, not that this is just Facebook, but it is driven by them at the moment. But yeah, Anish, any comments to to make here? I think Kevin kind of summarized mostly what I was about to say. You know, I, however, should point out certain things. So just to let you, you know, mm -hmm. go back in time and like probably last one year and look at uh, a large set of blockchain ecosystem, cryptocurrency ecosystem in China and what they have managed to do. Mm. So some governments do have the ability to change things. So even though you know, consumer, consumers might decide something else, uh, if you are within a walled society and you have controls uh, at the exit points, you could, re re you could really be enforced. And most people seem to forget one, one or two key pieces. One is the fact that even if you have crypto, for crypto to actually interact with real places, you need to have uh, these bridges. One of the bridges is the exchanges, right? If the exchanges are going to be kept under pressure and they are directly under the control of governments, they can really exert pressure and they can make it really, really difficult. If you know, exchanges stop listing a particular crypto, the value of the crypto in the open markets kind of vary significantly because what a market literally means is somebody has a want and that's being met by somebody else who, who has the thing that needs the want, right? And that's yes. what an exchange does. And literally, if they stop functioning, there'll be an interesting scenario. So I don't think any of the coins that are existing right now, including privacy preserving coins, are out of the reach of any of the governments in that sense. And also everybody says like, you know, if you have zero knowledge proofs and things of that sort, you can actually protect your privacy. But that again assumes, you know, traffic analysis has failed, uh, you know, other tools that is available to all these uh, governmental agencies, which literally is like, you know, compromising the endpoints where consumers do whatever they do, right? So yeah. all those tools are available to them. And I, I, I would expect that whenever they decide what they want to do, they will step in and do whatever that's required. So I'm a I'm on a skeptical side of things and I'm, I'm saying like, let's wait and watch what governments do. Yeah, let's wait and watch. Um, uh, excellent discussion. Uh, I think before we uh, close today's session, uh, one last final comments from our uh, guests. Uh, I don't think we've got any more questions. Uh, we have I think, covered all of them really. Um, Carl, one last comment, final points to make before we close on Libra. What do people do? Just wait and watch the developments and see what happens. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's, I think waiting, waiting and watching is ultimately how we ended up here. Um, just as a quick segue, the Libra project begun life as a model by which Facebook could reward users for using their data. Uh, mm. Ultimately, at the end of the day, with the Cambridge Analytics scandal, with everything else that happened, Facebook knows and is aware that incentivizing the days of basically taking people's data for free um, over the Internet are, are coming to a close. And Facebook knows that it needs to develop a way to incentivize people for taking their online information. 
Um, it's the single reason why Facebook profiles are dropping at an astronomical rate. And mm -hmm. that's why this entire project began life. And it was Facebook waiting, watching and seeing that led to what's been developed. And so I would actually almost argue that much like the US Congress has done, now is the time where if you have an opinion on it, now is the time to speak up because watching and waiting will only enable it to organically develop into some other kind of beast, whether you're for it or against it, you think it'll succeed or it'll fail, um, is kind of irrelevant. It's, it's not necessarily on any kind of designated track and we know where it's going to end. We, we just simply don't. And so what I'd hate to be doing is having a conversation in five years time with all of you again, talking about how Facebook's currency is now one of the number one currencies used across the world because I personally believe that a currency that, that's in the hands and control of a organization, a private organization that sells subscribed shares to members will not end well. Um, and, and so I think it's got to be worse. Now is the time to speak up. Will it be interesting? Incredibly so. Could it go badly? Yes. Could it end well? Yeah, equally so. But, uh, but I'm more of a skeptic. Thanks, Carl. Uh Kevin, we have a question from, from Simon Dyson, uh, who is also a, a cybersecurity and blockchain researcher. And his question is, do you think that this will be better or worse for broader blockchain and cryptocurrency community, this project? Um, I would say better because they, they have thought to a large degree about the security of the blockchain and it adds to what we know. And again, we have another now really proof of concept and we're able to test it to see does it hold up because again in some ways there's not that many blockchain programmers out there we're dealing with a new language which is developed again and we have our smart contracts in there and you know again that's such a new concept really it's not that many people who know how to develop smart contracts really um mm. again with the vm again we just we, we just have more again with their state machine replication again protocol we, we, we have something which we can, again, people can attack. We, we can look for the weaknesses. And of course, maybe Libra 2 or whoever else comes along will be able to build on the mistakes if we spot any mistakes here. So, so yes, it does add to the body of knowledge. And um, uh, again, they do, they really have thought about a lot of security aspects, really. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Dimelza, one last final comment. Should people be skeptic or cautiously optimistic about this project? Well, I'm very optimistic. I think that, I mean, m the other companies like Apple and Google, they're not involved. And I think that that's because they're working on their own money. And I think over the next decade or so, we're going to have corporations issuing money and competing with cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and also competing with um, state uh, uh, sovereign currencies like, like uh, the dollar. And so I think overall, this is going to, put pressure on um, regulators and, and uh, central banks to offer a higher quality money for people. It doesn't mean central banks will, will go away. It just means they need to adapt to consumer demand for, for medium of exchange. And I think um, it's, it's going to be exciting times. I think that it, it, as Cal mentioned, if, if the, if the corporation, a private corporation takes advantage of this um, and in five years from now um, is, is really, uh, using their monopoly power to to take advantage, I think uh, everyone can switch into to Bitcoin at that point. So I'm overall very optimistic. <laughs> yes. Uh, Anish, any last comments, advice for end users, general public, sure. or for students? Yeah. I mean, you are an educationalist. I, I heard one university has already started offering some, I think, a course or something on, on Libra. So people, so learn more about it and and stay hungry stay uh, focused <laughs> i mean uh, i'm probably going to be a bit contrary and i'll say a few things so just to be very clear uh, in addition to actually being a researcher i've worked on like three blockchain protocols i'm currently working probably at two more right now I mean, uh, it will be out in public very soon so i'm like a very hands-on person i've actually been an early advisor to ripple so then i reviewed orange paper uh, and prior to that, I was a researcher in security. So I've seen the game for a very long while. And uh, one of the previous uh, speakers was saying that there's a large amount of new knowledge coming in. I'm deeply skeptical. I, for a brief period in time, used to work in a language group in Microsoft Research. So languages, uh, there is very little that's been actually added. And if you have read the previous paper, uh, 
which was published by the team that was bought over by Facebook, uh, you will be very skeptical. Then going back to the next point about Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, I will admit I've met Cambridge Analytica three times. They were keen to ask me for my expertise and I said no. So I've seen the real arbitrage that happens when people have access to data. The whole democracy really depends on lack of such existence of arbitrage, which is effectively mm -hmm. like being able to optimize your basket of whatever resources you have to you know, influence a very small segment and tip over various decisions, right? And that's going to be very worrying. If, if Facebook is actually going to have this coin to get access to people's data, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll become increasingly worried. Uh, there are a couple of reasons. Firstly, they have actually bought, if you look carefully analyze the Cambridge Analytica incident and read the report that's been published by the parliamentary committee, mm -hmm. you notice Facebook actually bought data from external sources. The moment mm -hmm. they actually give you money, that will be the end of it. It's like whatever deeds they have done in the past, whatever shadiness that was there of the data they have, that will all become white. Okay? And mm -hmm. B is there is, in, in whatever I've seen so far, there's no proof for A of the machine learning algorithms they are using and B that they are going to have any privacy preserving characteristics. Okay? So mm -hmm. both of which is very worrying to me. As I described previously, it is going to be a massive case of lemon markets. So, you know, Facebook would know far better about the risk that your mortgage has than even your bank, right? That to yeah. me is like a truly terrifying scenario. Yes, I'm optimistic that there'll be more cryptocurrencies and blockchain ecosystem that will come forward, solve a lot of the crypto economic problems we are facing right now. And, you know, that is a separate thread in my head. And I, I agree with the previous speaker who said like both Google and other people are working on it. The funny thing is they already have payment systems. Apple has a payment system. Google has a payment system. Amazon has a payment system. So it's like, you know, they really can do various things already. And if and only if the efficiencies of those is, uh, you know, less than the crypto that they are going to have, right? Will they be forced to switch or we're thinking about switching? So again, uh, you know, I am uh, cautiously optimistic. Thanks, um, Anish. One last question we have here from Petco. Uh, from industry attack and I don't think we have got <laughs> an answer to this but I will put this question uh, to our uh, panelists and the question is has Facebook really stopped developing Libra at the moment after the letter from the Congress <laughs> Carl <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I think uh, look I can, I can speak spec Speculatively on that, uh, my, my gut feeling is absolutely not. Um, they didn't <laughs> stop doing anything when Congress asked questions around data scraping, data collection, uh, where, where they were, you know, selling information to, getting it from. Um, sure, um, I think on a look on a public face, uh, they're going to be seen to be working with Congress, but I genuinely believe, as a, as a personal opinion and a purely speculative point, I. I I think their, their feeling is, look, we're a multinational corporation. Yes, we're predominantly domiciled in the United States. And, but at the end of the day, the United States is only five point something percent of the population. So if necessary, we'll just kind of go elsewhere, uh, even if they need to, as everybody's pointed out, take it for a test run. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll kind of see what they do from there. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, a big thanks to all of our speakers. Thank you, Carl, uh, Kevin, Demelza, Anish and everyone who has joined us today we will upload this soon on our uh, youtube uh, channel and you will be able to watch it again there um, thank you everyone for joining us on, on this busy sunday and uh, thank you for your contributions you're welcome thank you thank you bye bye thank you thank you, thank you. thank you. thank you. thank you. thank you.